Hey, what's going on, good people? In this video, we're gonna be reacting to a video from Nate the Lawyer, where he's talking about the fact that a federal court is going to allow a student to sue his accuser and yell over false Me Too claims. Let's get right into it. In a 7-0 decision, justices ruled the former Yale student is not immune from a defamation lawsuit brought against her by a male student she accused of that male student was exonerated in criminal court, and he is suing his former accuser and Yale University over statements made during the investigation. Some activists are warning the ruling could discourage victims from reporting assaults in the future. Do these activists mean discouraging other liars from coming forward? The idea that holding someone who lied about this situation accountable means hurting future victims now? From reporting assaults in the future. Okay, so just imagine someone accuses you of a horrible crime and you then get arrested and go to court. A jury finds you not guilty in like record time. They look at the evidence and say, it's obvious this person didn't do that. But your job or school says, well, you know what? We don't believe the jury. We think the jury got it wrong. So then they hold, have their own like separate trial. And in that separate trial, they don't let you question the witnesses. Matter of fact, the person who's accusing you, they don't even let you question that person. They just believe the allegations, find you guilty, and either fire you or expel you from the school, no matter what the evidence showed. This is what happened to Saif Khan at Yale University. So first, let's talk about what happened. Saif Khan was a student at Yale University and he had a sexual encounter with another student. Now, they hooked up after a Halloween party that Saif was throwing at Yale. Now, the woman Khan had just had sex with later reported to authorities that she had been assaulted by Khan. Now, Khan was suspended from Yale and then he was put on trial for assault by the state. Now, this is where you get to play jury. See. Here are some of the details that the victim claimed occurred that night and the nights leading up to the event. Now, this story is basically a he said, she said, so the credibility of both parties are gonna be critical to your analysis. Now, the only way you can determine who's telling the truth is whose account best aligns with the evidence that's gonna be presented. I also want to be clear about how you should evaluate this. The accuser is the one that has to prove the allegations to be true. The person who's being accused doesn't have to prove anything. They don't have to prove they're innocent. So we have to look at the accuser's accusations, the evidence provided, to see if there's proof that Khan actually did these things. So first, let's look at the accuser's claims. Now the accuser's first claim was that Khan was a serial harasser and he was harassing her, particularly on Facebook. And as proof, she was showing messages in which Khan was trying to befriend her or make a friend connection on Facebook. Now, the evidence that you're gonna see is not something I just found online. This is actually what was presented at trial against Khan. So first, we looked at the Facebook messages. Facebook messages showed that she and Khan had multiple messages on Facebook, and she also accepted Khan's Facebook request, along with giving Khan her phone number so they can contact each other off platform. So here are the Facebook messages that was presented at the trial. Saif says, boo, what's your number? She replies with her phone number and says, I'm sad I had to leave. That was an awesome talk. The accuser also stated to the authorities that she wanted nothing to do with Khan. But text messages presented at trial show that she agreed to meet Khan and to go to dinner with Khan and to go to various events around campus with Khan. For example, when Khan invited her to dinner, this is what she said. Saif says, meal on Friday. She says, sure. I can do lunch on Friday or dinner any other day. All right, let's do Saturday, replies Khan. Sounds good. What time? 5.45. Trumbull. Works for you? Yes. Perfect. Court documents also reveal that she texted him again to accept his offer of tickets to a sold out Halloween concert by the Yale Symphony Orchestra. She asks, can I buy the ticket, please? He says, it's free for you. She says, really? Thank you, sir. He says, of course. I owe you. She responds. He says, oh yeah. Now remember, all this is important because we're trying to understand their relationship because the victim here had claimed that she was in fear and she was being stalked by Khan. But the court documents, as you see, showed that a lot of the time she was the one who not only initiated conversations via text and, and other means, but she continued communications with Khan throughout this time period. Like you just saw, asking if she could buy tickets from going out to dinner with them. Here, the evidence didn't really align with what the accuser was saying about their relationship. 
Thank God for these text messages. Guys, save your text messages. Just save them for a rainy day. As you can see, you never know. Yeah. Now, next, the accuser also claimed that the night after the concert, that Khan forced himself into her dorm room. But at the time of the alleged forced entry, the ID card records showed that Khan entered his dorm room shortly after the accuser entered hers. Now, that made the forcible entry into her room a little bit problematic. And the reason why is that Khan couldn't be in two places at the same time. At the time, she was saying that he was forcibly entering her dorm room. He was also using his key card to enter his dorm room. Now, after the incident occurred, the accuser says that she was trying to avoid Khan at all costs. But text messages after the encounter shows Casual communications with Khan, including text messages the morning after the incident. Here it is. Saif texts her, morning. She responds, LOL. He then sends an emoji. She writes, go to sleep. This will stay between us. That goes for you too. Okay, great. Let me know when you wake up and we'll have a meal. Khan replies, yeah, yeah, we'll do. She then replies, hey, are you 100% sure you use protection? Or should I take measures? Khan then replied that he did use protection. Then later on that day, she writes this. You're a piece of shit, Saif. I hope you know that. He writes back about two hours later. I apologize for making you feel that way. Is there anything I can do? Now this transition is a... See guys right there. I think that was the issue right there. You see what she said? Let's keep this between us. I think she felt as though he said something to someone on campus that he slept with her and the word got out. That's what pissed her off. That's what triggered her to lie and send him that text talking about, oh, you a piece of garbage. I think she was cool with having sex with him. She just didn't want the word to get around that she was actually with him. And our buddy, Mr. Khan here, looks like the type of guy that definitely bragged to his friends that he had sex with her that night. And this is why you don't brag to your friends about the women that you are with. Keep it on the low, guys. You never know how a woman will react to that. As to the main issue of the case, the accuser says that she had a high level of intoxication and could not consent to sex. Now, witness testimony about the accuser's level of intoxication were contradictory at best. For instance, one witness who testified at trial claimed that her intoxication was at a four on a scale of one to ten in terms of how drunk she was, while another witness said that her intoxication was at a ten. Now, the victim in this case had claimed to be extremely drunk to the point where it was even hard for her to walk to get around around anywhere. But the video evidence of campus security shows her walking around with Khan. So I'm going to play that video and let you judge for yourself whether she looks intoxicated or not. And we gotta love when they have video evidence that this woman is lying to. Um, yeah, she's walking just fine. She's she's good. Yeah, I've seen a lot of sloppy drunks in my day. And when people are drunk, drunk, they can't walk. They can't. You gotta carry them. Yeah, she's walking like a woman who knows she's gonna sleep with this guy. And she's gonna go ahead and give him some because he's a party promoter. He let her in the party. He's been chasing her. And, you know, she's a little buzzed tonight. This guy's looking kind of nice. She's gonna give him some and see how it goes. Look at her holding on to this man's arm, yeah. Oh yeah, she was ready, ready that night. Now you've just seen that video, but what you have to determine is if that video that you just saw is that portrays a person who is so intoxicated that they can't give consent to have sexual contact. Is that what you see in that video? would you expect to see if you were looking at a video of a woman who was too inebriated to consent to sexual activity? So now the final claim from the accuser was that she had not been sexually active with anyone else in the past six months, except for Khan. But the DNA swabs that were revealed at trial sh showed the presence of another man's DNA within the accuser. Now this contradicted her claims that she had not been sexually active for the past six months. Matter of fact, it contradicted the claim that she had not been sexually active for the past two weeks. So now the jury had a package. They had the digital evidence, the text messages, the ID swipes, the DNA swabs, and the witness testimony, whether all that evidence supported her accounts of what happened that night. Now, after evaluating all the evidence for about three hours, the jury came back and acquitted Khan of all charges. They said that he was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but Yale University didn't like that outcome. They decided to have their own trial, but this trial would be a little different. Number one, that 
evidence that was presented at the other trial, we, we're kind of going to, you know, ignore a lot of that. Also, we're not going to allow Khan to question the witnesses or even question the accuser. Matter of fact, he can't even be there in the room when the accuser does come and testify. Just so you understand, they didn't even let Khan's attorneys question the accuser during this, I'm calling it a sham trial. So to no one's surprise, Yale found Khan guilty of the assault and kicked him out, even though their trial was inherently unfair. So Khan sued the school because this trial was so unfair and the Connecticut Supreme Court ruled that this trial was so unfair it boggled the mind. So you heard that right. See, um, generally Khan wouldn't have been able to sue the school or his accuser because they would be protected under law. See, the law only protects Yale and the accuser if they conform with the fundamental principles of due process, like being able to confront your, your accuser and just overall having a fair process. But since Yale was so in the tank to just get Khan and they didn't have a fair hearing, this allowed Khan to now sue both Yale and the accuser for defamation because she made defamatory statements in that hearing. Now, a federal appeals court has just ruled that Khan's lawsuit can move forward and he's adding the accuser to his $100 million lawsuit against Yale, as it says here in the sun. Now, the ruling has shocked the college world because understand, schools are afraid because they've been doing this for years. And Khan is now the test case to see if false allegations can lead to defamation suits, holding both the institution accountable and the accusers accountable for those defamatory claims. I hope he don't end up settling out of court with Yale quietly. The only way to make these corporate universities stop is to take they behind the court and let them go through the full proceeding. It's really scary how some women have no conscience to the point where they just don't care anymore. They just want to destroy a man's life. And a lot of them have no remorse about doing so. You know how many men out there has lost careers over being falsely accused by a woman at work? Even some guys who didn't get charged with any criminal charges, but they definitely was pushed out of their job and straight up fired and lost their income. And some of them even talk about they lost their full 1Ks and all types of mess. And they are currently suing as well. And what trips me out after all of this is the fact that this man who is the actual victim, his name is all over the internet. Yet the false accuser is still listed as Jane Doe you know like they got to protect her privacy why isn't her name being released and she being charged her name and image should be made public just like his is I never understood why there isn't more consequences for someone trying to absolutely ruin another person's life like even if a year later it proved to be wrong this man still got to live with all the outcomes of getting kicked out of Yale. He can't just easily bounce back from that. She has affected this man's life long term. And it's like this woman can just stay protected and treated as if she's still some... Oh, man. It's, it's, oh, let me, let me slow down. I'm getting upset. But I'm about to stop this video right there. You guys drop a comment down below. Let me know what you think about this. And let me know if you have had any experiences with stuff like this and also be sure to hit that subscribe button on your way out like the video thanks for watching to the end i will see you guys in the next one